Good day, good night, and welcome to my World Cup preview show. I'm Kev Laramie, and this is our World Cup final preview. I hope you're doing well, I'm Kev Laramie. Welcome to Soccer Today, the magazine, the podcast, available everywhere you get all your favorite shows. I'm Kevin Laramie, sports statistician and soccer expert, breaking down the World Cup final from Argentina's point of view, from France's point of view. We will look, of course, at all the numbers. We'll break down statistically why I believe one of those two teams has a small advantage and will end up lifting the trophy. We'll end up lifting 6.175 kilograms of gold of 18 karat gold, which, by the way, is worth about $220,000 US with the prices today. But we got a really good show ahead of us. We're going to break down today, of course, what we saw in this tournament for France, for Argentina, for Messi, for Mbappe. We will look at all the different metrics for the attack, for the defense. Even miscellaneous, yes, a little reference to Die Hard, it is classified under M for miscellaneous. We're also going to look at, well, one of my favorite statistics coming out of this World Cup. FIFA has given us at FIFAplus.com some interesting metrics in the channels, in the breakthrough, in the final third, the final third entries. And we're going to look at how that has influenced the result of games and how that might dictate where the play, where the onus of play takes place on Sunday. But a great philosopher once said, to know where you're going, you got to know, well, where you've been. But before that, I want to invite you to subscribe to our podcast everywhere you find your podcast and to our website, soccertoday.ca. News analysis, you can find a podcast and a magazine show there as well and you can also find a lot more everywhere you find your favorite podcast and all i also would like to draw your attention to youtube subscribe on the youtube channel if you're watching us here on youtube thank you for subscribing to our channel we're all the way to 6 30 something and with your help we can continue our journey to a thousand subscribers. And of course, you can find this podcast everywhere you find your favorite podcast Spotify, Google Podcasts, Spreaker, and Apple Podcasts. As always, to know where you have been is well useful, especially in the World Cup. Let's look at the journey to the final, the road to the final for Argentina, for also. France, let's start with Argentina. Group C. They started with losing to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> That's how you start your World Cup. You lose to the team who finishes fourth. A wake-up call. And Messi, with hindsight, mentioned that the loss to Saudi Arabia was actually beneficial. It, it woke them up. And showed him the way, told them that there won't be an easy one and you will have to get your act together to produce a decent World Cup. They turned it around and finished top of their group in Group C Argentina, winning two games and finishing above Poland, above Mexico and above Saudi Arabia. Top of the group meant decent seating in the round of 16 as Argentina faced Australia and prevailed against the Socceroos. We will look at the bracket in a second as we now transport ourselves to Group D. France, Australia, Tunisia, and Denmark. France won their group, lost the last game against Tunisia. They were already through after the first two games. They did a lot of rotations. They rotated nine out of 11 players in the last group match game that they lost to Tunisia but uh, that is not necessarily important as we speak because with that loss they're able to rest some players that were able to show a lot in the knockout stage because with those results it led to this France Poland 
in the round of 16. There is a world out there that Argentina finished second of their group and they would have faced France in the round of 16. But no, that did not happen. Argentina won their group and was in the round of 16. It's funny how all the upsets, all the drama, Morocco's great Cinderella run, Croatia's great run to the semis, they eliminated Brazil, <clears throat> turned out the second and third favorites of the entire tournament face each other in, <laughs> yeah, in the final of this tournament. But quite an impressive road, and we can continue to look at the road if you want to bear with me here for a second, because I think it's impressive. Argentina beat Australia, then they moved to the Netherlands. The Netherlands played well, they had a great tournament. Uh, Memphis Depay, Cody Gakpo, let's not forget those two strikers played very well. But Louis van Gaal and that whole Messi, Louis van Gaal, the, the, the emotion that comes out of Messi, the anger, the win at all costs mentality, influenced by the infamous Diego Maradona. But the Netherlands and Louis van Gaal will remember this game for a long time. From 2-0 up, Argentina, 2-2. Then, of course, we all know how that ended up. Messi yelling at Dutch players. And uh, even in the post-press conference, it was very, very interesting to see the fire of Messi and how Messi was not necessarily just being a good guy. No press relations, no training, no cassette no, oh yeah, I'm happy to be here. No, 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 no. This is the win at all costs. This is I'm going to get under your skin. This is I'm going to do what I need to, to win. But we'll see when we break down this game a little closer later. That might actually cost a lot for Argentina. But France also had a pretty difficult path to the final. We forgot to mention Argentina beat Croatia. In the semi, it's just a few days ago. We remember. But France's path, Poland, of course, and then England in the semi, in the quarterfinal. Beating England, the revenge of the Channel War, of the under the year war, of course. Then France, Morocco. A game full of friendship on both sides. They share language, of course, with French being one of the languages of Morocco and, of course, of France, obviously. Friendship. On both sides, Mbappe for sure for France with Akimi of Morocco. But at the end of the day, the Frenchmen got the job done and qualified for their second straight final. They are the defending champions. Let's not forget, Argentina was in the final in 2014, losing one nothing to Germany in Brazil. 2014, as we are back right here live in the Soccer Today headquarters. Thanks for joining us if you are joining us live on YouTube or podcast. It's been a pleasure being with you over this World Cup while we reboot this show. SoccerToday.ca for all the information. We will be on CTV News channel all throughout the weekend. You can find me on Saturday morning at 10 a.m. breaking down the beginning of the game of the third place game between Croatia and Morocco. You can find me also Sunday, 6 p.m. on CTV News. I'll be breaking down the entire tournament and talking about the final that I am predicting on today's show. My prediction will be at the end of the show right here on Soccer Today as we start to break down the matchup. Well, it's a third time, no, fourth time that they face each other in the World Cup. Well, just a few years ago in 2018 and around 16. That's the latest matchup at the World Cup between the two. And France got the better of Argentina 4-3. France eventually ended up in the confetti, winning the entire tournament. They eliminated Messi in Russia in 2018 in the round of 16. And this led to a bit of a revolution in the Argentinian national team. Led to the appointment of Scaloni, who revolutionized a bit how this team plays. And a bit more of a, I would say, a flexibility, tactically. They've been moving from a 3-5-2 to a 4-4-2 with success in this tournament, adapting their not only formation, but also tactics from game to game to get the most out of Messi and to get the most out of the rest of the attack. Which, well, it's that time. It is time to break down the attack. It is time to look at a couple of different metrics that will 
tell us more about the forces, the strength, and of course, who has an advantage between the two. And of course, I'm going to get you the proper graphic right here on the screen. So to me, there's a couple of ways to see this. It's two of the most prolific attacks in the tournament. They're up there with England. They're up there also with teams like Portugal, the fourth best attack in the entire tournament. It's England, France, Argentina, Portugal, 13 and 12 goals respectively. So that's equal. And we look at the expected goals and you can see on your screen or if you're watching, listening just to the podcast, you can find the graphic on our website, soccertoday.ca. The preview articles have the same graphic that we have on the show here. So you can look at the numbers that we're talking about. So virtually identical expected goals for both teams when we're talking about the attack. 11.8 for Argentina, 11.6 for France. So that's not where we can see an advantage. So let's move on. Expected goal per 90. Well, again, very similar. 187, 193. Not a big difference. Possession average, two teams that perform better when they have the ball less than 55%. We can see here that on average in this tournament, it's in 58 and 52. They had more after their first game, and every single game since then, their possession average has decreased. So now we look at the shot on target per 90. That's an impressive statistic to me because they get about five shots on target per game which means that they get uh, three to four scoring chances per game at least and that is a good number a good statistic and we'll keep that in mind so we'll talk about the short the shot creating actions sca i love sca it does indicate an ability to a team to put the ball on target to create that shot to create that space to create the shot all those actions count so when you look france there's a bit of an advantage here for france france has 167 shot creating actions throughout the entire tournament in six games played when we look at argentina 143 it's not that much but it's one sixth of the number or or give or take so it's a little bit of an advantage here for france france can create more often with the ball but to me you combine the shot creating ability of france with how they score goals because as much as we talk about prolific attack and how argentina has scored a lot of goals where did the goal come from were they replicable are they expected yes the answer is yes for that but are they coming from the run of play well, well not really when it's come to argentina argentina has a non-penalty expected goal of 8.9 almost three full points below what they do have for France. And then you look at the penalty scored. We'll talk about the penalties a bit later when we talk about Messi and Mbappe, but there's penalties scored on Argentina's side and none on French's side during regular game, during the run of play. So that does influence the result to me. That does influence the score to me because there is... A lower amount of expected goals without penalty so non-penalty expected goals a lower amount on Argentina side it does give me an indication that France has a better creativity factor they have a better link up play up top and they can find ways to generate to generate shot creating actions which sometimes lead to goal creating actions, which lead to goals and to me if this is going to be a close game because I do believe it will be and I'll give my full prediction at the end of the show but when I look at one of the opportunities to create a goal scoring chance, I think France will have a better opportunity here. And when we look at the miscellaneous stats in a few minutes, you'll understand why there's another pathway to, to a shot or to an opportunity in that department too. So for now, yes, both have a great attack, prolific attack. They can score a lot of goals, both, both sides. It's not going to be a game that is won by four or five goals, right? There won't be four goals in this game. Uh, well, it could be because I just said that. But usually finals are 1-1-0, one, 2-0, one, nil, 2-1, two, nil, two, close affair, or even extra time or penalties. It's tight in finals. You, you don't want to be the scapegoat. You don't want to be the player that cost the World Cup to your team. So players play a little bit on their, on their heels and are a bit more careful 
And that does reflect. That's where the advantages come out. If everything is a bit more tight, a bit more tense, you nullify all the big, big advantage and it comes down to just a small detail. Then it could be how you get the ball on target a bit more easily than your opponent. That means to me, the advantage goes to France in that department. But the reason why I think they have a better way to do that is because of Mbappe's play. Mbappe has been, in my opinion, the player of this tournament. The headlines and the statistic when it comes to goals and assists, five goals, three assists for Messi, and the big headlines and the big uh, gestures and everything, you know, that does talk about a player of the tournament, but to me, is Mbappe. And you can look at his numbers. We'll talk about Mbappe in a second. But wow, what a tournament. So to me, Mbappe is my player of the tournament because yes, he's equal with Messi with five goals each. They're both top of the golden boot, both in contention for the golden ball. By the way, the first tiebreaker for the golden boot is the assist. Right now, Messi has three assists. He would win that. So we'll look at Messi's stats in a second, but let's look at Mbappe. Five goals. 3.4 expected goals, and let's remember that. It's lower than Messi. Expected goals per 90 of 0.64, a little less than one, but if you round it up, it'll be one. The number I want to bring your attention to is non-penalty expected goal, 3.4, very high, equal to his expected goals. He has not scored a penalty. All his goals are coming from the run of play or open play or free kick setting, but not from a penalty setting to assist. His goal and assist per 90, which is, to me, an indicator of an influence to the result of a game directly. If you score, or if you do an assist per game, or more than one per game as a striker or as a player, directly you will have over a high, higher sample size of data, you will prevail. So goals and assists per 90, 1.32, very impressive here. More than one and a half even if you round up every two ga every two games basically has a goal and assist or more what a performance by Mbappe in the tournament shot creating actions we've just talked about it 43 so how did the 167 shot creating action that France has 43 of those are for Mbappe and to me it's quite spectacular because his non-penalty expected goal is of course the the stats I want to bring your attention to because that is going to be the big difference maker between the two. Let's move to Messi. As we move to Messi here, sorry for the little uh, audio blackout here. But Messi has five goals. He also has 4.7 expected goal. Very high, very high. And 0.79 expected goals per game. So when you compare to... Um, to Mbappe's 3.4, there's a difference here. But take out the penalties. Take out his three penalties that he scored. So non-penalty expected goal of 1.6. That is very low compared to Mbappe's 3.4. Non-penalty expected goal. Which means to me, Mbappe has a better path to goal a better path to scoring a goal, a better chance of scoring a goal. Cha-ching! If you are looking for a money opportunity, goal scorer in this match, Kylian Mbappe. You won't get a whole lot. You barely will have 1.90 at the time of this recording, but that is better than nothing. <laughs> So his non-penalty expected goal per 90 of 1.26 means that on the run of play, he will score a goal every five games. He scored more than that. He scored two goals over the last six games from the run of play. Matt works out. So technically, if you're disciplined, <laughs> Well, he doesn't score in this game. If you don't give him a shot from the penalty spot, statistically speaking, overall, using the same sample size as this tournament, Messi will not score against France 
if you don't give him an opportunity from the penalty spot. That's what we're seeing here. So, three assists, that could be interesting. And he has a goals and assists per 90 of 1.26, very similar to Mbappe. But Mbappe's higher goal scoring and, of course, higher expected goal gives him a better shot here. The difference that makes it a little lower for Messi is Messi played extra time and penalty minutes, which, at the end of the day, dilutes a bit that statistic. But it is, to my opinion, virtually identical as Messi and Mbappe's. Messi's shot creating action 37 that is pretty similar to what we saw with Mbappe So to me it's truly the efficiency in front of the net and their opportunities to score Messi three of his five goals 60% coming from the penalty spot Kylian Mbappe out of five goals zero are coming from the penalty spot 3.4 of those goals of his five are from replicable moments in game non-penalty expected goals 3.4 when we look at Messi's five goals 1.6 are non-penalty expected goals which means that there is a significant advantage when it comes to scoring for France and I think it will be Mbappe's time to shine. And Mbappe will find the back of the net maybe better than, than Messi will. And one way that I think that's going to happen, well, it's because of how Mbappe gets to the net and where Mbappe finds his channels is free space and is able to enter the final third and break through the defense, break through the channels multiple times against Croatia we saw the sorry that's uh, is the one about Argentina so let's look at France right here France channel in the left look at that the left and the left inside channel for France nine times and six times respectively they were able to break through the final third and create chances on net from there on Mbappe that's where he plays that is his part of the field so if you look at the starting 11 of france against morocco mbappe fofana hernandez those were the most influential players against morocco there's a correlation there that's where they're able to break through the final third and with balls in the box and Olivier Giroud was able to score the second one there on the header with crosses and mbappe breaking down the channels going to the left see correlation here that's where it's all happening. That left side for France. If France is able to lock down that left side, then France will have the upper hand here. I think it's truly where France will dominate. So if they can find the space there for Mbappe and for Fana to serve Mbappe and send him and launch him, and Hernandez to overlap when needed and find yourself in the box, my friend, and find the ball once again. We saw him do that against Morocco. Turns out that it was one of the, the key of the game. It was to be able to be successful for France in the left channel and left inside channel. So now that we know that, how do we recreate the same thing? How do we recreate the same thing against a different opponent? Well, Argentina likes to play in a way that might facilitate France's opportunities in the left channel. Well, at least if they replicate the way they played against Croatia. Because against Croatia, to the surprise of many, they were able to find Messi not on his preferred right or right inside channel, which he was playing more, like a lot more, in the first couple of games in the tournament. In the second, in the quarterfinals that uh, Argentina played against the Netherlands, Messi on the right channel, almost by himself, break down the defense 17 times. So there is a conscious decision against Croatia to keep the final third entries, the breakthrough of the defense, if you will, to the left. So Argentina's left 
would be Francis's right. And Argentina's right will be Francis's left when we compare attack and offense and defense, right? So if France is able to once again control their left channel when they want to, which will indicate the right channel of, of Argentina that you see in front of you, well, those numbers will be different because Messi will need to be influential in his right. But they're trying to hide Messi. That's the whole thing. That's the whole point of this entire tournament for Argentina. They're trying to hide the GOAT. So when we look at the starting 11 of Croatia, of Argentina versus Croatia, a 4-4-2, different formation that they've used in most of the tournament, the 3-5-2 they've used, or 5-3-2, depending on the situation. Molina slot as a defender instead of midfielders, and you see the setup here. But Messi was more of a free roll and was fighting Alvarez in the middle. It was more through Alvarez, and that's where the breakthrough were happening, through the middle to the left side of the pitch for Argentina's attack, and they were able to break it down there. Messi, not that as influential, but influential from the penalty spot, influential from a couple of key passes when he was cutting back inside. Now that will mean will dictate where, where the team plays is that situation here. Will Argentina try to highlight Messi's position once again and move it to a part of the field where they're influential? But if they move it to back to the right and leave it there, where which it was against the Netherlands, that's where Messi was mostly played. And if you look at Messi's heat map against the Netherlands, it'll be more on the right side of the pitch. And if you look at Messi's heat map against Croatia, it's more in the middle of the pitch. So when I look at the possibilities here, of having Argentina having to play Messi on the right, right in front of Mbappe, that's where it's a, maybe a bad idea for Argentina. So if Argentina keeps it on his left, on their left, which means McAllister, Enzo, and Alvarez, they have a better chance of winning. If it's the opposite, and France is able to dictate where they play with the ball, France will dictate this game. That is one of the keys of the game. There's a couple more keys of the game in the defenses in, of course, a weird segment that I call miscellaneous, that we will look at more obscure statistics, things that we don't necessarily look and talk about all this time, but to me, they represent an opportunity to find maybe another advantage for the team we'll take a small break when we come back we'll continue and break down the defenses for this tournament right here on soccer today this is our argentina 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 versus croatia preview croatia wow it is late here by the way as we were recording this show it is argentina france the world cup final preview right here on soccer today We're back on soccer today. I'm Kev Larmy. Thanks for joining us once again on this preview show. You can follow myself on Twitter at Kev Larmy, and you can follow this show at Soccer Today CA. SoccerToday.ca is our website, and you can follow our brand new Twitter account at Soccer Today S. No, Soccer Today CA. All right. We've talked about the offensive, we break down the channels, we looked at a lot of expected advanced metrics. We'll continue our deep dive of the World Cup final between Argentina, Argentina, I can't even say it anymore, Argentina and France, right here on Soccer Today. Time to look at the defenses. There is some advantages here and we will look deep into it. Goals against, four for Argentina, Five for France, 2.4 expected goals against for Argentina. That's the best in the tournament. And 6.7 for France. So France does give more expected goals. So technically, you would look at these numbers and be like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh, yeah. Argentina, this is very good. Oh, the, 
the defense of the the baby blues is really good. L'Albi Celeste, they're going to have the advantage. They're going to nullify France. France, who have five shots on target average. Well, the opponent of Argentina usually have 1.26. And France keeps their opponent to 2.5 shots on target per game. So, you would think that the defense of Argentina is better. But to me, it doesn't mean everything. It's a bit more complicated. There's a bit more nuance to it. Argentina's defense has absorbed better. But it was put under pressure. Argentina's defense has seen troubled time that were cleared off the line. Has seen moments and penalties surprise and save them in games. So, I want to draw your attention to the numbers below. And if you have been following my works over the last a few weeks, well, you've, you've heard about this. You've heard about me talking about tackles, recoveries, and interception. It's one of my ways to quantify the ability of a team to recuperate the ball. The ability of a team to book pressure, tackle, uh, create turnovers, to intercept the ball. So, so all those things combined, so tackles, recovery, interception, gives me that metric. And when I do a little quick calculation, so Argentina, 100, 278, 42, that's 420. 119, 293, and 67, that's 479. There is an advantage for France here. Yes, Numerically speaking, is 59 doesn't mean anything here, those numbers, but it's an advantage. France is able to get the ball back more. So, depending on where this game is played, will it be on France's left side with Mbappe? Will the breakthrough come from there? Will it be on the other side? Maybe Dembele finally has his breakout game with France and is influential in this one, which is not out of the realm of possibility. But when I compare the defense, I think France's ability to recuperate the ball when they need because of tackles, recoveries, interception, that equation that I'm talking about. Because of that, I think there's a higher chance that France can dictate where the play is going, where the play keeps going. And if they don't have the ball, which is fine, they like to have the ball 52% of the time in this tournament so far. So if they don't have the ball and they can find a good path to get the ball back and find an open channel and send Mbappe on the left. I think those are all together. I think if France is able to, to dominate on the left side like they would want to, it'll be a long night for, for, for Argentina. Because, which will bring me to my miscellaneous comparison, let's compare the miscellaneous M for miscellaneous. Right, Marvin? Is this under C for the block C, or is this M for miscellaneous? It's M for miscellaneous. Alright. This could be influential here in this result of the game. Penalty ones for Argentina 4. Zero for France, but France conceded three penalties. So when you just look at this at face value, you're like, oh my God, there's a good chance that Argentina wins a penalty and they score on a penalty and France does not have a penalty because they haven't won a penalty in this entire tournament. And we, we've seen Messi score three times in a penalty spot. So maybe it is something that can happen. But uh, to, to do a penalty, you need to do fouls. And that's where there's a big difference. Yellow cards and fouls. I'll draw your attention to that aspect, which together we'll call discipline. 12 yellow cards for Argentina. It's the highest in the entire tournament. 74 fouls committed. It's not the highest in the tournament, but it's the highest in the two teams here that we're talking about. 49 fouls committed for France. Quite actually disciplined the French. They just did not choose the right position on the pitch to do their fouls, which were in the box. But sometimes, like... In uh, their uh, quarterfinal games, that's just you can can see the penalty without affecting the result of a game sometimes. So, so I do give that. And and when I look at the replicability, when I look at the amount of fouls committed by Argentina, and now the eye test too, 
Argentina has been a fiery team, has been a team that plays with a lot of emotion, but a lot of emotions comes harsh tackle sometimes that could lead to a yellow card, that could lead to a foul. And sometimes the foul happens in the box. And if the foul happens in the box, well, that's a penalty for France. I can see France winning that way. I can see, statistically speaking, I think there's going to be a regression. There's too many penalties on one side, none on the other. There should be a regression. But yellow cards, fouls committed, to me indicate actually a lack of discipline on Argentina's side. And then you add the emotions of a final. You add the hype, the overhype of a final. It's, of course, amplified. Everything about this is amplified. So... I could see France having an advantage in the discipline. I can see the French players having played for this just a few years ago and won it four years ago. Argentina lost it. Maybe that will stay with Argentina. Also, then we can look at crosses now. Crosses is a big advantage for France. 108 crosses, 77 for Argentina. We just saw Giroud score from a ball whipped in the box. So crosses and you can add corners. And all balls whipped into the box. That could be a big advantage for France. France has taller players than Argentina. It, it might be simple, but players like Rabiot could be favorite for me in this one to score a goal. Players like Rabiot could be a big influence in this game, scoring on a ball whipped into the box. And then we can go to post-shot expected goal differential. Yeah, that's a mouthful. And it's quite deep into the statistic maybe but you're gonna follow me for a second just just bear with me because it's important it gives an indication of an advantage for one team over the other here i think france has an advantage for the goalkeepers and i think mixed into all the crosses that are going to be whipped into the box that could be the big difference because well the goalkeeper for argentina could be one of their well, of their, uh, their Achilles heel. We saw Martinez do a couple of mistakes that uh, fortunately did not lead to goals or anything dangerous in the last couple of games, but could have. But when you play against a team of like France who will whip the ball in, will find ways to put the goalkeeper under pressure to test his reflexes, we will see that happen. So you include that statistic here of the post shot expected goal differential which well in lehman's term okay quickly if we talk about that statistic it's convoluted how you can calculate it and if you go on my website soccer.ca look at the article that i have previewing this game there's a link to an article explaining what is that statistic so argentina conceded 1.4 goals more than they're supposed to with the expected goals that they have had France, they've conceded less than they're supposed to. So, you have an advantage of 0.05. You're in the green by 0.5, which you round up to one. So, Loris saved one goal during this tournament. And one or two goals were not saved by Martinez. So, basically, that's what we mean with post-shot expected goal. So, in conclusion, and now I'm going to get ready to, to do a drum roll. I don't even think I have a drum roll, but... Uh, Soon, I'll give you my prediction that you can put some money on because uh, last time that I had a prediction on my Twitter feed, I said France would be Morocco 2 nothing in regulation. And I hope you listen because if you did, like I had, well, it was worth your while. So let's break it down one last time. Let's look at my prediction for this and you can find my prediction written form on my website soccertoday.ca by the way thank you to all the visitors of the website at soccertoday.ca i'm kevin Larme, a professional statistician it's been a pleasure creating that website for all of you and i've enjoyed having all the numbers and all the visits it's been really good so my prediction is as follows all right so let's put some music we need some music for this so let's put uh I don't have a drum roll. Do I have some? Uh, I have some techno. All right, no, some jazzy music. Let's go with some jazzy music. 
All right, prediction time here with Tucker. Prediction time! Argentina has, yes, a defensive advantage. But their offense has been overinflated with their performances from the penalty spot. France has a higher proficiency in generating shot creating actions from open play than Argentina. It will be a very close game, but Mbappe will be too much on the left channels. France will take advantage of that aspect to whip the ball in the box profusely and use the height advantage of players like Rabiot to score. A header. Yes, the goal will come from a header. 1-0. I can see that goal being scored in extra time. It could be a nil-nil all the way to 90th minute any injury time and falling into extra time and then 1-0 there. I can also see it being nil-nil all the way to penalties and it's actually decided from the penalty spot. Which, at one point, I still would favor France because of the goalie and because of the experience they had in tournament finals over the years. So, that is what I would favor. But at the end of the day, I can see it very closely being fought. It's a closely fought match. And as finals tend to be, it will be that. And in the end, it's going to be a beautiful day. And for the first time in over 50 years, we're going to get back to back champions. Allez les Bleus, third star, la troisième étoile. On top of the logo, it's going to appear, as you can see on your screen. Allez les Bleus. La Marseillaise, you're going to be standing in confetti. Sorry, Messi, it won't be for you. But Le Bleu winning a close one. Talent will prevail. I hope you enjoyed this preview show. You can follow me on Twitter at KevLarme. You can follow this show at Soccer Today CA. That's Soccer Today CA. You can find everything that I do here on our website at SoccerToday.ca. That's SoccerToday.ca. Thank you very much. You can follow this show also everywhere you find your favorite shows. If you want to contact me and you would like to, to have me on your TV show, on your radio show well you can do so kevin on soccer at gmail.com over the next few days i'll be on ctv news i'll be on Kelowna 1150 radio am also on other places near you and as always until next time i'm kev laramie i hope you enjoyed this show and as always i wish you a great soccer <laughs>